Welcome back to Keeping History on Two Wheels, where we give you the little snippets of history that make the bigger, broader picture just a little bit more clear. Today, we're at Red Cliff Plantation, which is a state park here in the state of Georgia. Come on with us, will you? Welcome back to Keeping History on Two Wheels, where we give you the little snippets of history that make the bigger picture just a little bit more clear. Today, we're at Red Cliff Plantation, which is a state park in the South Carolina. <laughs> this is crazy. Welcome back to Keeping History on Two Wheels, where we give you the little snippets of history that make the bigger picture just a little bit more clear. Today, we're at Red Cliff Plantation, which is a state historic site in South Carolina. Come on, and let's learn some history. Just on this dirt country back road in Aiken County, South Carolina, you'll find a gem historic site. It's called Red Cliff Plantation. And I would invite that visits the Augusta or Aiken, South Carolina to come see it. was one of four plantations owned by James Henry Hammond. Shortly after acquiring the 400-acre estate, Hammond wrote that he had named it Red Cliff from the Red Bluff in front of it. His goals for Red Cliff were specific. It was a state rather than a working plantation, an architectural and horticultural showcase, and the center of domestic life for the Hammond family. The mansion at Red Cliff was home to James Henry Hammond and generations of his descendants. His great-grandson, John Shaw Billings, final owner of Red Cliff, donated the plantation home, slave quarters, stables, grounds, and artifacts to the South Carolina State Park Service in 1973. The stories of these structures and the surrounding lands is both the story of the family that owned the place and the stories of the numerous families who worked here. Families such as the Henleys, Bynes, and Wigfalls lived at Red Cliff for multiple generations, men, women, and children who were once enslaved on the property and, well, after emancipation, continued to work here as sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and paid employees. Visitors at Red Cliff today see a landscape greatly changed from how it would have appeared back in 1859. Gone are numerous outbuildings, rows of grapevines, and orchards. Today, the park provides a setting for exploring the plantation system and experiences of the enslaved. It reflects the historical experiences and impact of the white and black families who lived and worked at the site, the extent slave quarters, mansion, and landscape serve to highlight the plantation's rich and varied history. Before learning about Red Cliff Plantation, you'll want to learn a little something about the man who built it, Mr. James Henry Hammond, along with the slaves who constructed all the structures on property, and the three generations of Hammonds that inherited the property after his death. Born November 15, 1807 in Newberry County, South Carolina, to Elisha and Catherine Fox Hammond, he graduated from South Carolina College in 1825, where he was a member of the Euphradian Society, 
and went on to teach school, write for a newspaper, and study law. He was admitted to the bar in 1828 and started a practice in Columbia, South Carolina. He established a newspaper there in support of nullification. Hammond secured his financial independence by marrying Catherine Elizabeth Fitzsimmons, who was a shy, plain 17-year-old with a substantial dowry. He became a wealthy man through this marriage and entered the planter class. He ultimately owned 22 square miles of land, a number of plantation houses, and more than 300 enslaved persons at any given time. After his marriage, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives as a member of the Nullifier Party, serving from 1835 until his resignation the next year due to ill health. After spending two years in Europe, he returned to South Carolina and engaged in agricultural pursuits. Managing his large holdings took much of his time. He was elected as governor of South Carolina serving from 1842 to 1844. The legislature chose him for the United States Senate in 1857 following the death of Andrew P. Butler, and he served from 1857 until his resignation in 1860 in light of South Carolina's secession from the Union. Hammond died on November 13, 1864, just two days before his 57th birthday, at what is now Red Cliff Plantation State Historic Site in Beach Island, South Carolina. A Democrat, Hammond was perhaps best known during his lifetime as an outspoken defender of slavery and states' rights. He popularized the phrase, Cotton is King, in his March 4, 1858 speech to the U.S. Senate, saying, In all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties. To perform the drudgery of life, it constitutes the very mud cell of society. He went on to utter the often repeated words, You dare not make war on cotton, no power on earth, dares make war upon it. Cotton is king. Hammond promoted Red Cliff Plantation as his ideal of the perfectly run plantation in his plantation manual written in 1857 and 58. It includes a wide range of material with detailed rules regulating treatment of pregnant and nursing slaves whom he allowed to nurse their infants for 12 months, old slaves no longer fit uh, for heavy field work, together with the rules about clothing, quarters, food, etc., in addition to livestock and crop management. Hammond rejected any government encroachment on slaveholding, even in wartime, when the South Carolina government requisitioned 16 of his slaves to improve fortifications for Charleston, he refused, calling it wrong every way and odious. Also, when a Confederate Army officer stopped by to requisition some grain, he tore it up, tossed it out the window, and wrote about it that it had compensated him too little and that it was like branding on my forehead, slave. Hammond's secret and sacred diaries not published until 1989 described without embarrassment his sexual abuse over two years with four teenage nieces, daughters of his sister-in-law, Ann Fitzsimmons, and her husband, Wade Hampton II. He blamed his behavior on what he described as the seductiveness of the extremely affectionate young women. The scandal derailed his political career for a decade to come after Wade Hampton III publicly accused him in 1843 when Hammond was governor. He was ostracized by polite society for some time, but in the late 1850s, he was nonetheless elected by the state legislature as a U.S. senator. Hammond's damage to the girls was far-reaching. Their social prospects were destroyed, considered to have tarnished social reputations by his behavior. None of the four ever married. 
Hammond was known to have repeatedly raped two female slaves, one of whom may have even been his own daughter. He raped the first slave, Sally Johnson, when she was 18 years old. Such behavior was not uncommon among white men of power at the time. Their mixed-race children were born into slavery and remained there unless the fathers took action to free them. Later, Hammond raped Sally Johnson's daughter, Louisa, who was a year-old baby when he bought her mother. The first rape apparently occurred when Louisa was 12. She also bore several of his children. His wife left him for a few years after he repeatedly raped the enslaved girl taking their own children with her. She later returned to her husband. In the late 20th century, historians learned that Hammond, as a young man, had a homosexual relationship with a college friend, Thomas Jefferson Withers, which is attested to by two sexually explicit letters sent from Withers to Hammond in 1826. The letters which are held among the Hammond Papers at the University of South Carolina, were first published by researcher Martin Doverman in 1981. They are notable as rare documentary evidence of same-sex relationships in antebellum United States. Red Cliff Plantation, completed in 1859, was once the home of James Henry Hammond, three of the generations of descendants, and numerous African-American families like the Henleys, Goodwins, and Wigfalls, who worked at the site as enslaved laborers and later as free men and women. Now one of the many historic plantations that South Carolina has opened to the public, this site encompasses the ambition, wealth, and power of James Henry Hammond, as well as the injustices and suffering forced on the hundreds of enslaved peoples who were forced to live and work on the land. A successful cotton planter, congressman, governor, and senator, Hammond spent his life defending the southern plantation system and his status within it. Just one of several historic plantations South Carolina is known for Red Cliff provides a setting for exploring the experiences of the enslaved as well as the larger institution of slavery. The plantation boasts one historic house museum with 4,000 plus artifacts from four generations of the Hammond family from 1859 to 1975. Two historic circa 1857 slave cabins used to interpret the history of generations of families enslaved at Red Cliff, one expansive porch where you can sit and catch a breeze, one magnolia lane, perfect for strolling through these old, magnificent magnolias, 19 primary source documents, 26 images, and hundreds of stories in the Visitor Center exhibit. 369 acres with a rich and complex history that underlies its beauty, and one hiking trail approximately 1.7 miles. You know how I love my interpretive rangers, and I always think that they are absolutely the best place to go for information on all of these sites that we visit. Well, Red Cliff Plantation did not disappoint. Interpretive Ranger Brandon Bruni gave me the tour of the place, and let me tell you, he is full of information. So I would suggest that if you ever go to Red Cliff Plantation, take the tour and hope to God you get Brandon Bruni. I want to tell you I appreciate you watching the video, and please go right over here and hit the uh, subscribe button, and don't forget to hit that bell so that you'll be notified whenever we do an upload. Always remember, every trip starts with a step, and that step, well, it starts with you.